473. 473.
Hallelujah. That's good, isn't it? Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight to the book of Jonah, chapter number chapter number one, Jonah chapter one. And we'll continue reading and studying through the book of Jonah as the Lord has directed our hearts. I've enjoyed studying these um, this um, chapter, the book of Jonah, the last several days. The Lord warned my heart about certain things and convicted me and helped me in several matters, and I trust the Lord will do the same for you tonight. Jonah chapter 1, uh, we looked on Sunday morning at uh, the subject, this ain't an ordinary fishing story, and it certainly is not fishing story. In fact, it has little to do with fishing, but a whole lot to do with God and a whole lot to do with Jonah. Tonight I want to share, I thought, um, as we look farther in chapter 1, on you can run, but you can't hide. You can run, but you can't hide. Look at verse 1 again. Jonah says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. I'll stop reading there, if that's correctly read, reading verses 1 down through verse number 5. I want to emphasize primarily verses 3 and 4 tonight as we look again in the book of Jonah on the subject, you can run, but you can't hide. Let's bow together while we pray. Father, we thank you for the day you blessed us with. We're grateful for the time that you've given us around your word to share a portion. God, to these your people, I pray that, Lord, as I've prepared and studied the best I can, that, Lord, you'd allow things to come to my heart. You won't said tonight, Lord. I've got a whole lot to say, but, Lord, I, only, I just want to say what you want me to say. And I pray that, God, you would give me unction, Lord. May the Holy Spirit anoint me to say these things that's in my heart to say, only these things, and we'll be careful to give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. When a man or woman starts to rebel against the Word of God and the clear direction of God, they first begin by thinking incorrectly about who God is. They have a misconception about this God that they supposedly serve. Such is the case with this man Jonah. God has called Jonah, of course, to go to Nineveh to cry against it, for the Bible said their wickedness has come up before the Lord. I once again remind you uh, this evening, as I said on Sunday morning, Nineveh was secondary to the goal of God for Jonah's life. So many have emphasized the Ninevites in the story they emphasize Nineveh, they emphasize a fish or a whale or a great sea monster. They emphasize the sailors or a storm or a worm or a wind or a plant or the sun. But uh, this book of Jonah has little to do with those things. All of those things are secondary. They're tools in the hand of God to deal with what he longed to deal with in the life of Jonah. It's really about God solving a crisis in the heart of this man Jonah. More specifically, it is about God transforming Jonah, the preacher, 
into Jonah the sign. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, he says that an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but he says, there shall no sign be given unto that generation except Jonah the prophet. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so Jesus says that uh, the sinner man, those that don't know Christ, those that don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, this is the sign that the Lord Jesus gives them, this prophet way back in the Old Testament. Now, God could not have selected a more unlikely candidate to be a missionary than this man, Jonah. I do not think there's ever been another missionary, as I said Sunday, that went to his mission field with the idea, I want my subjects, I want my mission to all go to hell. Amen. I don't think when David Brandon went down and up and down the eastern seaboard to preach to the eastern Indians, the Cherokees, and all those Indians around the east coast, I don't think Brainerd ever thought, I hope all these savages go to hell. I don't think when Kerry landed in India that he thought to himself, I want all these native Indians in India to go to hell. I don't think Livingstone or Judson at Burma or Patton in the New Hebrides Islands ever thought to himself, I want these my mission to go to hell. I think their mission was that they might be saved for the glory of God. That was their mission. That was what they were there to do. But old Jonah, Jonah's altogether different. Jonah had a heart willing and wanting his subjects, his mission to go to hell. In calling Jonah to go to Nineveh, God revealed to us and to Jonah his great missionary heart. Now, it did not take long for Jonah to answer God's call, did it? In fact, God said, go, and Jonah said, no. Uh, God said, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. But Jonah, Jonah said, I'll not go there. He did arise, but he did not arise and go to Nineveh, but rather he arose and went down to Joppa. Brother, I see a partial obedience there. Jonah did arise. Jonah did get up on his feet. But Jonah did not go the direction that God would have Jonah to go. Now remind us all tonight, partial obedience is complete disobedience unto God. He was supposed to go to Nineveh, but instead he paid his fare to go down to Tarshish. And when we look at this from where we sit, we might think to ourselves, what was Jonah thinking? In fact, if I... If I could look Jonah in the eyes tonight, I would say, Jonah, what was you thinking? How foolish you were to think somehow you could flee from the presence of an almighty God to make it worse on Jonah's behalf. He was a prophet. Jonah understood theology. He knew better than most the omni-attributes of God. Jonah knew that God was omniscient, that God was everywhere at the same time, and yet Jonah thought somehow he could leave the presence of God. I remind us all tonight when we rebel against the Lord and against God's Word, we think wrongly about who God is. The things we once thought securely about God in our own life will become blurred. We'll not think the same about those things when we rebel against God. Amen? I think that's true for my life. What a foolish plan for Jonah. Jonah, being a prophet, should have known better than that. He should have known better to flee from the presence of God. He knew full well the psalmist and the, the Hebrew hymn book. I think, I think Jonah knew what David wrote in Psalm 139, Whither shall I go from the Lord? Uh, and where shall I? He said, Whither shall I go from my, thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I Ascend up into heaven, uh, David said, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, he said, Thou art there. If I have wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Uh, Jonah should have known that psalm, but Jonah's mind is blurred. 
about God's Word and about who God is. Amen? And there's a likelihood tonight that uh, we would all see Jonah's attempt to escape foolish and silly. And yet if we'd be honest tonight, we'd, we'd say that we've been there with Jonah. Maybe not. We've never probably ever paid our fare to board a ship and go to some foreign country. But I would say this, brothers and sisters, we've all ignored the voice of God. We've all avoided God's house. We've all walked away from Bible reading and prayer. We've all, my friend, went days only and apart from looking into God's Word, and we've neglected to whisper a prayer to God. How many times have we knew what the Bible says about certain matters, uh, but instead of adhering to what God says, uh, we've walked away from what God says. Brother, that's walking in Jonah's footsteps. Because of our own rebellion, we've overlooked what God has said about clearly about certain matters. And by doing this, we've all walked that downward path of Tarsus as Jonah has walked. Amen. And let me say this as a side note. We're living in days today, brothers and sisters, when you're going to be tempted to go alone to get along. If you don't hear nothing else I say tonight, pay attention to that. You're going to be tempted to go along to get along. And if you're not, if you're walking toward Tarshish, you're, you're going to fall. Amen. you got to be where God wants you to be in order to succeed against that sort of temptation. Amen. And so, listen, be careful about where you're aimed. Be careful about where you're rising up and going toward because you might find yourself going toward Tarsus alongside this backslidden preacher named Jonah. But one of the most gracious things about God is God is a pursuing God. Can I get a witness right there? Chapter 1 begins with Jonah running from God, but it ends with God running toward Jonah. His mercy is running after, it's running after me. His goodness is running after us. Praise His holy name. God is running after His running prophet. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, God runs faster than we do. And He always catches what He chases. Now listen, there's no place in this world that we can go outside the all-seeing eye of a sovereign God. If we go down to hell, He's there. If we go up in heaven, God's there. If we have wings in the morning and fly away, David said, God is also there. And so don't try to flee from God's presence. Amen. Amen. Now let me give you three things about this as time will allow. First of all, as we, we learn some things about Jonah, aren't you glad God's given us some examples in the Bible that we can learn from? Amen. And so pay close attention. I know you've worked all day and you're tired and worn out, but pay close attention to this. Number one, I think we can learn that you can't escape a problem that's internal. You can't escape a problem that's internal. Notice again what Jonah's attempting to do. He's trying to flee from the presence of an omniscient God. And that little phrase, fleeing from God's presence, in essence means that Jonah was turning in his resignation. He was saying, God, I, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I'd rather commit suicide to run the risk of being a vessel of mercy for those wicked Ninevites. Lord, I'll just get on this boat and I'll sail. I read today, Brother Matthew, where the Jewish people did not make good sailors. The Phoenicians did. And so Jonah uh, throws caution to the wind, gets on board that ship with those Phoenicians and thinks to himself, I'd rather be sailing on these waters then stay where God wants me to stay where God wants me to go. He's running from God's presence. He's saying, Lord, I quit. I give up on what you want me to do. Jonah, listen to me, Jonah had an internal problem. His problem was selfishness. His problem was he wanted his will above God's will. He wanted his desires above God. God's desires. He thought what he wanted was more important to what God wanted. When a person attempts to disregard God's word, they're attempting to flee from God's presence.
presence. Isn't that right? Listen again, Jonah wasn't afraid to go to Nineveh. He was a prophet. He could call fire down from heaven. He wasn't afraid of those Ninevites. No, he was afraid of what God might do for those Ninevites. He did not want God to show mercy because he thought to himself, if God spares them rather than kill them, they're going to go back on God and they'll kill us. And so I'd rather God kill them and I'll become a kamikaze. I'll, I'll become a sacrifice myself. He loved his people so much he would rather die to save his people than to live and, and those people be, uh, uh, listen, let go in mercy. Amen. And so he flees from God's presence. And for Jonah, listen to me now, for Jonah the answer for the dilemma was to change sceneries. He thought, I'll just leave this familiar scenery and go somewhere else. The hill country of Israel was getting too stressful, and so Nineveh, and Nineveh looked like a terrible place to visit, by the way. And so he says, I'll change scenery. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Internal problems can't be solved by changing scenery. Now get that. Internal problems can't be solved by changing scenery. Now you can go to the beach. You can go to the mountains. That's what, that's what Jonah did. He said, I'm going to the beach. Everybody goes to the beach when they're having trouble. You can go to the mountains. You can go to the bottom of the sea. But if you've got a problem in your heart, Changing sceneries won't help it. Amen. And I've talked to people down through my ministry, and they've said, Preacher, we're just going to go somewhere else. So-and-so gets on my nerves. So-and-so makes me mad. But their problem is not so-and-so. It's normally their own heart. And changing churches won't help it. I had a gentleman one time. It, he was a good guy. I love him. And he had a teenage boy. The boy was about 17. He had behavioral issues. He was a good boy. He was just all boy. And he was 17 but acted like he was 10. And, and I was preaching one night. On Wednesday night, I studied all for three, three or four days on this message. And, and he was acting up back there with the teenage section. And he was about six foot two, big old boy. His daddy was a bodybuilder. Massive. Dude, looked like John Rambo. And he was raising that boy by himself. He had a daughter and a boy. He was a, he was a good man. Um, but his boy was acting up one service, and I had enough of it. And uh, I called him down in front of God and everybody. I said, Gabe, come up here and sit by your daddy. You ain't going to act up while I'm preaching. And so it embarrassed him real good, but he didn't act up no more. And I said, I didn't spend three days studying this message for you to act up while I preach. And his daddy came up to me after and said, Preacher, we're just going to go somewhere else. I said, let me ask you a question. Does your son act up at school? He said, yeah. I said, you change in school? No, the problem's not what you think it is. The problem's in the heart. The heart of my problem is the problem of my heart. Every problem I have, Joe Biden, as much as I would vote him out, doesn't affect me not one bit. He's not my problem. You're not my problem. My problem is I'm too full of me. And that's what Jonah's problem was. That's what people have marital problems oftentimes because each person is too full of me themselves. And when you're full of yourselves, you can't see clearly to, uh, about anything that's going on. Jonah had a heart problem. Secondly, uh, he had a head problem. Amen? He had a head problem. Listen, he didn't want to go down there. He was having a good time preaching where he was preaching. He had national pride. He had religious prejudice. He had a great assignment. He was preaching to kings down in 
northern part of the kingdom. But now God says to Jonah, go up there, to go down there to Nineveh and preach. And Jonah says, I'm above that, Lord. Up to this point, Jonah, listen to me now. Jonah, I've got so many sermon series in what I'm telling you tonight. But Jonah didn't have a heart for God or of God. Jonah had been doing everything he had been doing from mechanics. Amen? Everything he had been doing, he had done it well. He was a, a successful prophet. I mean, to put it in New Testament times, he had a large gathering. He had a large congregation. He was doing what he was doing from mere mechanics because that was the right thing to do. But he didn't really have a heart for God. And I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I've seen people like that in every church I've pastored who showed up and they gave and they did things. And yet they did, they did not have a heart for what they were doing. They'd done it simply because it was the right thing to do, but they did not have a heart for what they were doing. Does that make any sense? And I've got a confession to make, brothers and sisters. I've not always done what I'm doing tonight from a heart filled with obedient love toward God. If I'm not careful, I can get so sidetracked by the things of this world that I'll not do what I do from a heart filled with love. Amen. And old Jonah, that's, the, that's where Jonah is. I mean, and I've, again, I've seen people, they, they come to church, they do churchy things, they say churchy prayers, they wear churchy attire, they do things out of churchy, in, in, a, in a churchy setting, but they don't do what they do from a real heart of devotion. And I'm going to tell you something, as I've been in this county for over seven years, the problem of the churches, the Baptist churches in Lawrence County is, there's a whole lot of mechanics. There's a whole lot of do-gooders that know everything. Now, I'm not speaking to you now, unless the shoe fits. I guess I am. I've not encountered that here. Uh, but I, I'm, everybody's a theologian on Facebook, you know. Amen. Everybody's got an answer for everything. But I'm going to tell you something. If what I do, and let me say this, if what I know doesn't come from a heart of love for God Almighty, what am I doing? Jonah had a heart problem. Jonah had a head problem. Amen. And uh, he, he was going his own way, filled with himself. Listen to me. A and Jonah must die. I can't wait to get to the next chapter. Before Jonah be could be used of God, he must die. And before I could be used of God, I've got to die to myself and be resurrected. Amen. That's what Paul said. I die daily. I crucify myself. But what he's saying is uh, we must die to ourselves, uh, die to our desires, die to our wills, uh, die to our selfishness, that, that God might be glorified in what we do and say. Amen. And so you can't escape a problem that's internal. Do you have any internal problems? I'm sure we do. Secondly, you can't escape a presence that's universal. Two times in one verse we're told that Jonah was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Amen? And so my question tonight to Jonah is, where was you headed, Jonah? Where was you going, brother Jonah? The Bible tells us that Jonah left Israel and traveled to Joppa, the closest port city, and found the ship going to Tarsus. What about that? Now, there's much debate as to where Tarsus was uh, on the geographical map, where Tarsus was. 
Uh, but I'm going to tell you, we don't know for exactly where Tarsus was, but we do know one thing. Tarsus is the opposite to where God wants his children. Amen. Praise God. God don't want you going to Tarsus. No. Tarsus represents the opposite end of where God is. And I've seen countless people who once sat on the church pew who they sit on a bar stool because they thought to themselves, I'll just pay my fare and go down there to Tarsus. I've known people with wonderful marriages, but for some reason or another they are divorced tonight because they thought to themselves, I'll flee from God's will for my life and pay my fare and go down, down, down to Tarsus. Jonah fled because Jonah had never died to Jonah. Amen. Self always has to die. Now notice with me very quickly something that jumps off the page at me. Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and the Bible said he what? He found a ship. Now this is simple. I know I'm a very shallow preacher. If you want to go to Tarsus, I may preach this on Sunday morning to the Sunday morning crowd too. If you want to go to Tarsus, there's always a ship headed that way. There's always one in the port. Amen. Jonah pays his fare. And he finds himself a ship. And then the Bible said, Jonah pays his fare. If you want to go to Tarsus, There'll always be just enough money to buy the ticket. Isn't that right? If a man wants to murder, there'll be a gun somewhere close. If a man or woman wants to have an, inf an act of infidelity or, an, uh, or some kind of affair, there'll be somebody close by. It doesn't start just by popping up. It's in the heart of that person before it ever happens and the devil Listen, can put somebody in your path to make you trip up on your way to Tarsus. Amen. And let me say this. Be careful about judging the will of God by favorable circumstances. Jonah made his way to the port and sees the ship going where he wants to go. And he has enough money to buy the ticket at the counter. He pulls the money, he buys the ticket, and Jonah must have thought what a a lot of people have thought in the past, well, this must be God's will. There's a ship going that way. I've got money to buy that ticket at the ticket booth. It must be God's will. It must be God's will. Be careful about taking promotions or jobs that look favorable if it takes you apart, takes you out of God's will. Be careful about activities. Hear me. Be careful about activities that might take you from God's will for your life. That's a ship in the port of Joppa headed to Tarsus. Amen. Amen. Be careful, boys and girls, about dating, dating that boy or girl that you think is just that person, that person he's attractive, she's attractive, and, and, and they're, they're going to be just fine. Be careful because every door that may look like it's from God it doesn't always mean it's from God. It might be a doorway to get you away from, listen, Jerusalem and get you to Tarsus. That might be what's going on in your life. Amen. Money, more money doesn't always mean better for God. I've seen people, they come into church and they're hot and they're panting after God and God's word and then all of a sudden they need more money. I may say, preacher, and I used to fight it, but I just let them get on board. They'd say, well, preacher, it's going to be more money, but I'm going to have to work. And I know, listen to me, I know medical professionals have to work. I know that. You know I know that. But if it's a choice, you ought not get on board the ship going to Tarsus. Because it never, never does end well. How do you know, preacher? Look at what the Bible. Do y'all believe the Bible? Say amen. amen. Notice with me how many times the word down is mentioned. He went down uh, to, to Tarsus. 
He went down inside of a boat. He goes to sleep, and so he goes down to sleep. And then the Bible says the mariners threw him down into the sea, and a fish took him down into the ocean. And then he goes down to Sheol. And then the Bible says he goes down, down, down to the mountains. It never ends up. It's always down. In fact, the only time that the word up is mentioned is when the whale vomits him out. Amen. Brother, God let you sink down, down, down farther than you've ever sunk before. He'll be with you, but he'll let you sink. And he'll be there with something to rescue you, praise his holy name, but he'll let you sink. Number three, you can't escape a price that is substantial. Jonah has found the ship and paid for the ticket. Listen to me. He boards the ship and finds a quiet corner to go to sleep. He thinks to himself, I've successfully escaped. Alexander White, the old commentator from 200 years ago, writes, No booking clerk could have told Jonah what it was actually going to cost him to get on board. And so Jonah goes to sleep. And I know you're a Wednesday night crowd, and I know this is odd to be pretty. You are saints and angels. Uh, and I mean that. I'm not being facetious. Well, a little bit. But he gets on board. He falls asleep on his call and commission, asleep on his duty. Sleep to the perils that surrounded him, thinking, I've got it made. I'm going to Tarshish. And as soon Jonah must have thought, as God rains down fine brimstone on those wicked Assyrians in Nineveh, I'll get back on that boat and I'll sail back to Joppa and I'll make the 200 mile trip up to Jerusalem and live happily ever after. And God's going to be all right with me. But he might not have slept so soundly. If, if he'd been able to see through a few inches of planking what was swimming quietly beneath the keel of the boat. Neither would the rebellious Christian sleep so soundly if they knew what was going on down the road. Oh, God help me. Listen, I, 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 if they knew what, what my, the perils might be, down the road, it never ends well, you say. Preacher, I've got friends, and they, they don't even go to church, and, and they're making lots of money and doing their thing. And that's fine. But if you're God's child, if you're God's child, there's a fish out there for you. I remember vividly, I remember as a 14, no, a 15-year-old teenager, uh, my family had been out of church for, since I was seven or eight, my daddy was making fistfuls of money. I mean, back in the, back in the 80s, he was making a quarter million dollars a year. That's a whole lot of money. He had 60 employees working for him. We was traveling around the country making money. I was going into school. Had to live in up north as a Yankee, a southerner, out of place. And I remember when God jerked the rug out from under all of that. And Brother Donnie, I could take you to the place where I was when when everything got took from us. And my mother always had a brand new cutlass every other year. But my daddy had to do a sheetrock job for an old Buick, beat up Buick with no hubcap. Because the, the Uncle Sam came and took it all away. And I remember loading up in an old 85 Scottsdale Chevrolet square body truck. Five of us. 
my mama sitting beside my dad, my brother in the middle, me on the end, and my sister somewhere on top of all of us. Going back to church for the first time when everything had been taken because my mother and daddy had put everything before the Lord. Miss Gail, I remember as a little boy or 15-year-old teenage boy, I remember finding my place in the altar that morning as my mother and daddy wept their way back to God. I mean, they got right with God. And I remember being overwhelmed with a sense of the Holy Spirit in my own life and just weeping uncontrollably, thinking, we got home, we got home, this is, this is home. And that first Christmas, man, we had been used to getting, my daddy never was, we didn't never was spoiled, but we, we got a little bit of something. I remember the first year, my mother said, now boys, we can't afford nothing but a flannel, flannel shirt. And we got a flannel shirt for Christmas. Because it wouldn't no work. Because God had let a big old whale come by. But we were happy in Jesus alone. <laughs> and I'm here tonight because of what happened with that fish in my own family's life. Listen to me. In all of this, Jonah received the mercy of God because God came looking for Jonah with all the elements of his creation. He speaks to a storm and wind and he has a plan and sun and, and a worm. He speaks in all the creations of life as a vessel of mercy to draw Jonah back to himself. Aren't you grateful for that mercy? Amen. Listen to me. You can run, but you can't hide. He runs faster than we do. Amen. 